You 
brothers and sisters how are you i hope that you and your family your loved ones are all in the best of health today again i am very happy and it is really a privilege that i welcome you to that hour and the place where we are loved and we hope that today we will be a blessing and because this is the culmination of our ascend talk series this is the last of the four talks of the Ascent series. We have climbed three mountains. You remember? So far, we climbed Eden. Eden was a mountain, and there was Adam and Eve. And then after that, um, I preached about uh, Noah in Mount Ararat, God's restoration. Last time, Brother Nino, talked about Abraham as our father in faith, and the mountain was Mount Moriah. Brother Pete was supposed to conclude this talk series, but I'm filling up his place as we all solemnly play, pray for his speedy recovery. We thank God for his amazing healing hands that he laid upon our dear brother Pete. In behalf of the English Feast community, I would like to express our thanksgiving to the Lord for taking care of our dear brother Pete and express our deep affection and love for our leader, brother Pete. Welcome to talk number four, our last and concluding talk. We call this talk, again, the mountain of God. In the other mountains, God met one guy 
or a bunch of guys God made met Abraham. He also in the other epiphanies or theophanies he met prophets, the judges. What are these called? As I said, these are theophanies. A theophany is an appearance of God with an intense manifestation of his presence that is accompanied by an extraordinary visual display. And you know what's outstanding in this talk? We are going to talk about Mount Sinai. Do you know what's outstanding about Mount Sinai? As I said a while ago, when God appears, he appears to a few people or a individual, to a prophet, to a judge, to Abraham. But this time, God does something very astounding. He appeared to the entire nation, the entire nation of Israel. You know, when I was preparing this talk, I was touched in a very personal way because as I preach to you, I am also preaching to myself. I can relate to the many circumstances in my life and attest to the veracity and the reality of this talk. Today, I want to preach to you the main message of this talk is that God will meet you where you are. I know that in this talk, you will come to the knowledge that truly God meets us wherever we are. No matter what state of spirituality or faith or circumstances we have in our lives, God always meets us where we are. Amen. I, this is really very true, and I know you're going to be blessed in this talk. But before we begin, let us now begin to pray our favorite prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Today, I receive all of God's love for me. Today, I open myself to the unbounded limitless, overflowing abundance of God's universe. Today, I open myself to God's blessings, healings, and miracles. Today, I open myself to God's word, so I become more like Jesus every day. Today, I proclaim that I am God's beloved. I am God's servant. I am God's powerful champion. And because I am blessed, I am blessing the world in Jesus' name. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Last time, Brother Nino talked about Abraham and Mount Moriah. Today, we are going to talk about Moses and Mount Sinai. I know we are all familiar with the story of Moses. But let's skip the part of Moses' childhood and go to the point in his life where he was already a shepherd remember, in the wilderness. Remember, he, he, he went away of Egypt. And then one day, you know this story, one day something extraordinary catches his eye. And this can be found in the words of Scripture, Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. He led the flock far into the wilderness and came to Sinai, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a blazing fire in the middle of the bush. Moses stared in amazement. Though the bush was engulfed in flames, it didn't burn up. This is amazing, Moses said to himself. Why isn't that bush burning? I must go and see it. Now, what I will tell you next will blow your mind as it did me. Because we know about the burning bush, but actually what is the deal with this burning bush? You know, 
I can almost see the writer of Exodus winking at us because he hints about something else. You know what that is? You listen to this. Huh? That burning bush is called Sine. It's a Sine tree. It is called Sinai also. It, it is spelled with the exact letters of Sinai. And when you know what will blow your mind more? There is another hint that ancient readers would have picked up, whereas we modern readers will never ever get. Keep this in mind. Actually, Sinetri and Mount Sinai are one. I will try to break this down later. Another hidden message is that Sine and Sinai rhymes with the Hebrew word test. Again, I would say this again. Sine and Sinai rhymes with the Hebrew word that means to test through this tree and mountain god will test you do you know brothers and sisters that the presence of the lord is most felt when you are tested in life review your life when was your faith most called for when was the presence of the lord most felt wasn't it when you had your test in life and then through that test god will reveal to you who you truly are it is through the testing that we will have a self-discovery and it is god's way of telling us who we are my friend are you going through a life test right now? Are you going through trials or temptations? You know, they expose of what we are made out of inside these tests. And it will push you into three simple realities. Whatever test you have. Reality number one, you are not God. Reality number two, that God is God. Reality number three, you need God. That's why I repeat my overall message, God will meet you where you are. But here is the problem. A lot of people don't know who they are. They don't even know where they are in life or what, what their place is. A lot of people really do not realize. They do not come to the knowledge how desperate they are for God's life. They don't even realize it. And, you know, that is the reason why God gives you or gives all of us tests so you will be bonked on the head and realize that am I talking sense to you brothers and sisters not too long ago I was one of these people who did not realize who I really was I thought I was who I was there was a point in my life that I really thought that the world was in my hands. I have a very successful career. I retired early. I went into business. I had no problems. Anything I wanted. All my hobbies was there. I wanted to, I wanted to race cars. I had uh, a racing car. I wanted to go abroad. I went abroad. I, I wanted a good family. I had a good family. I wanted a beautiful wife uh, with the Lord, my daughters, my career was good. The world was in my hands and I had, I thought I was who I was. 
until he took three things in my life that I that I value. I thought I valued God because I thank God, and I know it was God's grace that I was being blessed with good health, good family, relationships, a good career. But then he took the three things that I had to let go. Truly, I realized those those things made me realize how attached I was with material things. There came a point into my life that all that I've worked for for the last 30 years of my life was almost gone. It was through certain businesses that I nearly lost everything. 2017, before I joined the feast, I nearly died here in Jakarta. One week, he took away my health. It was in that ICU room, all by myself, that I realized that. That I did not know where I was, that if, even in fact, I will still be waking up tomorrow alive. There was also a point in my time that he took somebody whom I hold dear and I love so much, the most influential person in my life, my mother. Those were the days that I realized that I am powerless. I am not God. That only God is God and I need him. At the end of the day, thus, those were my realities. Brothers and sisters, I don't know which, what trials you have, what, what temptations you are giving into. But you know, the Lord meets you as is where is. And I hope that you give ourselves up to Him with all my strengths, all my sins, with all with all my warts, wounds, weakness, everything in me. Come Lord. Please say this. I we need the Lord. He is our Savior. He wants to meet us. He wants to visit us. He wants to change us. I hope that we have come to the realization that we can say, Come Lord, I need you. I am not the Savior. You are. Meet me, Lord. Visit me. Change me. In Jesus' name. I hope that prayer remains in our heart every day. Because truly, if we mean this prayer, God will meet us wherever we are. Remember I said a while ago how Sine and Sinai rhymes and it is also a another word for test. Here's another big question for you. Is there another tree in the Bible that was filled with God's presence and that was connected to a test? You know, again, again, where is it in the Bible that there was a tree filled with God's presence and was connected to a test? Any guesses? Well, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, brothers and sisters, the author of Exodus was pointing to the idea that the tree of life is the same tree in the Garden of Eden. And, and that burning bush is the tree of life. Well, I hope you're getting now the idea of how brilliant the ancient writers are. You know, the Bible is full of design patterns all throughout. They 
sort of buried thousands of hyperlinks in words, phrases, rhymes, names, places, events, trying to sew the entire Bible together. Yes, brothers and sisters, the tree of life is on fire. God was sitting on it. You see, in talk one, we learn from Brother Pete. He said that in Genesis, we mentioned that Adam and Eve was eating from the tree of life. Why? Most likely, it was terrifying. Instead of eating from the tree of life, they chose to eat from the tree of knowledge. So they go instead of eating from the other tree, the tree of knowing good and bad, because what? It was attractive to the eye, pleasing to the eye, good to eat, desirable to gain wisdom. That is temptation. Good to eat, pleasing to the eye, wealth, the flesh, and pride. This isn't only Adam and Eve's story. It was, the, it was also the story of Jesus. Remember, he was tempted by the devil. Again, the same thing. Turn this bread, he will give the kingdom, and the devil went through that again. The wealth, the flesh, the pride. Brothers and sisters, this is Adam and Eve's story, this was Jesus' story, and this is our own story too. The battle between materiality, the flesh, and our pride. Yes, this is the reality of our life. Temptation, trials. It is no wonder when we say to our Father, Lord, deliver us from all temptations. Another version, deliver us from the test. What are tests? Test is temptation and the trials we have in life. The reality is, during those tests, I told you, you will know who you are. Or, do you succumb to the trials? Or, do you believe that God will meet you where you are? It is an opportunity to be holy if we meet God in those moments of trials, in those moments of temptation. However, there is a reality. In those moments, there are two things happening. God is the scary option. However, sin is seductive. There are many deep theological reasonings for this reality, but I will give you a very light explanation that you can relate to. One time, a farmer was calling a meeting with his uh, uh, animals, and they are saying, you know, this poor little girl needs food and she's very hungry and the chicken said to her i will give an egg because i can provide an egg and then he looked at the pig and the pig was trembling why well you know the story he has to offer himself to feed the young hungry girl. You see, let's make this clear. For a lot of people, they think that following God means giving. Giving an hour or two every Sunday, giving 10% of the income to God, or giving service. May I correct this understanding? Following God is not about giving. It is about dying. I will repeat. Following God 
is not about giving. It is about dying. There are no chickens allowed in heaven. You know, I'm preaching to myself because this is really true. You cannot meet God and remain the same. Let me repeat. You cannot meet God and remain the same. Abraham was a different man when he had the presence of the Lord. Moses was the same. He was not the same man when he met the Lord in the burning bush. You cannot meet God and remain the same because you need to die. My friends, brothers and sisters, listen to me. God is fire. God is not a nice decoration that you hang around the wall. He is not your amulet or your lucky charm that you pray to. He is not he is not about when you pray, giving you boost bumps. That's also good, but he's not that. God will turn your life upside down. Everything will change when you meet him. Your values, your goals, your priorities. He will overhaul you and you will die. That burning bush, the tree of life, is God's presence and He will give you a software for you to be upgraded. Upgraded to what, Brother Danny? When you have truly meet the presence of our Lord and you accept Him and He meets you where you are and accept Him, His presence, that burning bush, the tree of life, the software, He will upgrade, upgrade you what? The old version, your old software must end and the new version of you shall begin. Let's revisit, let's revisit the story of Moses. At the time the nation of Israel reached Mount Sinai, remember? Moses traveled to Egypt. He asked Pharaoh to set his people free. After experiencing ten plagues, Pharaoh lets him go, and then Moses leads them through the Red Sea. But that's not where the story ends. Moses leads Israel back to where he met God. He brings them to the foot of Mount Sinai. The book of Exodus scripture says, All of Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord has descended in, on it in the form of fire. The whole Israel nation saw this. A theophany and a nation saw. The Lord came down on top of Mount Sinai. Remember what I told? God is scary. They stood at a distance, you know, the people of Israel stood at this stood at a distance, trembling with fear. Uh, they, they told Moses, You speak to us and we will listen, but don't let God speak to us directly, or, or we will die, they said. You see, brothers and sisters, the scripture reading alludes the burning bush whom Moses was first called by God, I want you to realize that Mount Sinai becomes the burning bush. Instead of a bush being on fire, the whole mountain was on fire. Exodus says, all of Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord has descended on it in the form of fire, like the bush. Indeed, in the presence of the Lord, that burning bush and Sinai, that burning mountain, are one, and there was a test. 
Sine and Sinai are one, and there is a test. This story of Moses repeats the key elements of our Ascent series. From the stories of even when Adam was tested, to Noah, to Abraham, God tests the people. All at the mountain to see whether they will listen to his voice or choose to take wisdom into their own hands. To do things into our own terms. Let us look at the response of Israel. What did Israel say? They stood out from the distance, trembling with fear. This is like, who, me? Me? No, 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 no. You, Moses. You. You know, when Moses asked them to climb the mountain, what did they say? You speak to us, and we will listen. But don't let God speak directly to us, or we will die. In other words, Sorry, Moses, we don't want to meet God. He's too scary. Friend, we are like this also. That's why the church is, sometimes it's very weak. We, we, we have delegated the priests and nuns and the religious professionals to communicate to God for us. This was the big test of Sinai. Will you climb the mountain of the Lord? Israel did not. It is just like Adam and Eve when they did not eat from the tree of life but chose to eat from the tree of knowledge. And just like Adam and Eve, they went to the other tree. The nation of Israel had their own idea of God because they became crazy and built from themselves what a golden calf and worship it why in the world did they make a cow well because god was so scary they created a version of god that they can control in this insane story the writer of exodus was describing perfectly 3,000 years ago, even our problem of today. Ask me why. Huh? We like taming God. We like putting him in the box of our own expectation, our own selfish expectation. What do we want? We want him to be predictable. We want him to say, God, answer our prayers. Brother Nino said last time, we even make him like a genie. If not, magtatampo ako or I'll get angry. Some people think that he is Santa Claus. If I do good, I will have a nice gift. If I do good, so I'm doing good, so you will get something in return. Or a judge who sits there in heaven and watches us and decides if we will go to heaven or not. No, 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 this is the wrong theology. We already have a seat in heaven. Whether we go there or not, it's up to us. I need to ask you this very basic question. It's up to you. What is your concept of God? Is he your Santa Claus? Is he your genie? Is he just somebody up there in heaven trying to judge you? Or do you believe God goes down to the mountain and wants to be with you where you are? Isn't it that after Israel fell into this idolatry, Moses goes up to the mountain and ask God's forgiveness. What happens in the next story is unbelievable. Despite that, God goes down the mountain. Israel had a tent, which was the traveling tabernacle in Exodus. Said so that while Moses was in the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and hover at its entrance. 
when the Lord spoke to Moses. Fact, that tent came to the bottom of Sinai. So the fire in Sinai went down the mountain. First God says, come up the mountain. Then Israel says, no. And then he fell into idolatry. And what does God do? He doesn't just shrug his shoulders. Says, you don't want to come up? Well, it's up to you. No. He went down to them, dwelled in that tent. And they brought that tent and the cloud was with them in their wilderness. Let me close this um, series by telling you a personal story. You know, before I was focused on the finish line, the finish line is God. I want to go and finish the race, do my best, and meet the Lord in heaven. I think this is what we all want to do. Brothers and sisters, as we are about to end this talk, let me close it with a personal story. Before I was really focused on the finish line, that finish line was God. The finish line was heaven. I want to finish the race, do my best. But I will admit, most of the time, it is difficult and almost impossible. To tell you the truth, sometimes I, most of the time, I feel tired. There are so many distractions, temptations, mistakes. Sometimes I know I already fall short of whatever expectations I have, much more God use a higher expectation. There was also a feeling that the Lord was so far away and divorced from the realities of my of our day-to-day -day life. I think we all feel this also. But somehow, somewhere along the way, I realized that it is not so. I have changed my paradigm that somehow and for many of us, we think that God and heaven is the finish line, the goal, the standard, the summit, the perfection, the mountain top. You know, I realize if God is just the finish line, we are doomed. I think we just need to throw the towel and call it quits because... I don't think we can make it. I've come to realize that God is not only our finish line. Actually, God runs with us. With God, it's okay to accept what we need to improve. With God, I have the strength to move on and never give up. With Him, together, I grow. Although not perfect, but getting better day to day. And he will help me reach the finish line. He is my friend who runs with me. That when I fall, he picks me up. He puts his arm around me and carries me all the way to the finish line. I came to realize that we need to learn that He is not far away. He is available to us every day of our lives. He is patiently waiting. He is kind and merciful. He wants to run with us to bring us to His mountain. He does not wait at the finish line. Indeed, Jesus is God, the God that comes down from the mountain. Who is Jesus? Jesus is the Lord. 
The Lord that comes down from the mountain wants to be with us in our fears, in our imperfections, yes, in our sins, in your tears, in our brokenness, in our wounds, through all the anxiety facing this uncertain future, I am able to hope. I am able to trust. And I am able to have faith. Ask me why? Because Jesus was our God, came incarnate in the flesh and dwelt among us. Because why? He wants to come down to us and meet us wherever we are. Every day, every hour. And this is who God is. Where, here, exactly where we are. He wants to meet us. He wants to meet all of us. He wants to meet you, brother. So that's it, folks. I hope I have delivered this message and I was really more preaching to me. <laughs> and I hope I also preach to you. And as we say in Mass, the Lord be with you, truly, four times we say it, in the beginning, in the Gospel, in the Offertory, and before we leave, we tell each other, the Lord be with you, because He wants to meet us. Brothers and sisters, the Lord be with you, and may your dreams come true. Bye-bye from now. I'll see you in the next feast. God bless you, all of you. May the Lord be with you.
Oh, oh.